Coming in at number 5 we have the narwhal tusk. If any of you have ever seen the movie Elf then you're familiar with the cute narwhal in the beginning of the movie. And that movie really brought narwhals to the public's attention and making this sea creature more popular than ever before. But so much about this creature is a mystery. In 1577 the English explorer Martin Frobisher led an expedition of 150 men to the northern Canada in search of gold but they had come across something they had never intended and that was the sea unicorn. The myth of the unicorn goes back centuries and the business of unicorn horn trade was sustained through the middle ages and renaissance by vikings who killed the so called sea unicorns, cut off their horns and sold them for an astronomical price. As European naturalists became more familiar with the world's animal the myth of the unicorn faded, the mystery of the sea unicorn continued. Frobisher's discovery was actually what we know today as the narwhal but the horn itself continues to be speculated by many. But the horn is apparently not a horn at all but is a tooth. The relatives of narwhals include species like the beluga whales, orcas and dolphins but the mystery remains of how did this massive freakish tooth evolve in this one specific species after its ancestors branched off from whales with ordinary teeth. Many scientists and researchers debate about what this tooth is used for and some suggest it's an acoustic probe, a rudder, an ice picker or a spear for battling predators. These creatures don't make it easy for researchers to see them use their tusk for anything at all so it makes many people continue to question it. Many have come up with many different theories about this so called horn and what they use it for and why they have it. It has created a huge debate between researchers and scientists to this day but no definite answer has come out to this day. In at number 4 we have the submarine disappearances in 1968. This is one giant mysterious situation which is the disappearance of 4 submarines from 4 different countries in 1968. The USS Scorpion, a Soviet submarine K129, a French submarine Minerve and the INS Dakar went inexplicably missing over just a 5 month period and the last 2 disappearing only 4 days apart. The exact causes of these sinkings remain unknown and remain a mystery over 50 years later. The INS Dakar was scheduled to arrive in Israel on January 29th 1968. When it didn't return searches went out to find it but after a while there was no sign of the missing submarine. So the search ended on February 4th and the 69 man crew was officially declared dead in 1981. The cause of the sinking was never determined and theories say that either a mechanical or human error caused a catastrophic accident or that the submarine snorkel was damaged after hitting another ship causing it to flood. The Minerve was on the training operation in the Mediterranean on January 27th 1968 and when they were on their way home the men were caught in a bad storm. When it was 30 miles away from the port the Minerve made contact with the men on land and said it would port in about an hour but an hour came and went and the submarine had never returned. A frantic search was conducted with 20 vessels and aircrafts trying to locate the Minerve but it was eventually called off on February 2nd when they found nothing. The K129 with a crew of 98 descended on March 8th 1968 and almost 2 weeks into patrol on the North Pacific the K129 failed to send a scheduled radio message. The Soviets soon began a frantic search and after 2 months of no sign of the submarine they gave up their search. The cause of the ship sinking remains unknown and will likely never be known. Almost 3 months after the K129 the USS Scorpion a nuclear powered attack submarine with a crew of 99 men went missing in the Atlantic while on its way back from a patrol in the Mediterranean. It was sent out on February 15th 1968 and toward the end of its patrol it radioed that it was expected to return on May 27th but as you can guess the USS Scorpion would never return. Like the others many searched for the lost ship but on June 5th the Scorpion and its crew were declared presumed lost. Over the years there have been multiple searches for these submarines but only parts have been recovered and it's considered one of the biggest mysteries that happened in the sea. No one knows why so many went missing in such a short amount of time, how exactly they went missing for so long and what exactly made these vessels disappear and this is a mystery we may never get the answer to. Coming in at number 3 we have the Bermuda Triangle. Named for the triangular shape of around 500,000 square miles of ocean between Miami, Bermuda and Puerto Rico, for centuries the Bermuda Triangle has been mystified as a harrowing patch of ocean where sailors and pilots are prone to lose contact with the natural world and disappear forever. Back when Christopher Columbus first sailed the area he claimed to see a giant ball of light in the sky that crashed into the horizon and made it glow. Soon after all sorts of strange events happened in the area including several boats mysteriously disappearing and in one incident in 1945 an entire squadron of US torpedo bombers vanished into thin air due to all these weird instances giving this place the name the devil's triangle. The exact number of ships and airplanes that have disappeared is not 
known, but it's estimated that around 50 ships and 20 planes have been victim to the Bermuda Triangle, and many of these mysterious disappearances of these ships and planes have never been recovered. Many see the Bermuda Triangle as a real phenomenon and have multiple theories to try and explain this mysterious place. And some of these theories are human error, paranormal explanations, violent weather like hurricanes, the Gulf Stream, which is a major surface current within the ocean, methane hydrates, which is a form of natural gas that causes bubbles to form around the ship and ultimately sink it without warning. All of these are only theories, and the Bermuda Triangle to this day is the most notorious sea legend of all time. In at number two, we have the Gulf of Mexico's cursed shipwreck. An estimated 4,000 shipwrecks litter the seabed across the stretch of water, and the Gulf of Mexico is one of the wealthiest locations for maritime archaeology in the world. In February 2001, oil workers for ExxonMobil were laying some pipeline when they happened to stumble upon a shipwreck about 2,600 feet deep. After discovering the wreckage, a team was assembled to explore this mysterious ship, but nothing seemed to go right. The exploration submarine malfunctioned right as it was getting ready to go down to check out the wreck, and that was only the beginning of these mysterious mysterious malfunctions. Others include video monitors going out whenever they fired their thrusters, sonars breaking and hydraulics going haywire with no explanation for any of these problems. After nothing working and things continuing to break, the Navy sent a researcher submarine down to investigate the wreckage, and on the way down it suddenly self-destructed, and somehow when it finally did get to the wreck, its arms were too short to reach anything. Six months later in July in 2002, a team working aboard the NR1 decided to launch a robotic sub down to the wreck site, but the malfunctions continued. The second the rover entered the water, it veered to the right and went out of control. The tether had caught in the propellers, which caused the vessel to smash into the underside of the ship and the rover was never recovered. Later in the summer of 2002, the curse would continue as a ship from Sustainable Sea Program of the NOAA offered to pick up artifacts from the site. The first time the vessel attempted to leave the dock, debris was lodged in the propeller. The second time the propeller locked and the ship ended up in dry lock, needing repairs. Over the years, many others have tried to learn more about this wreck, but little was found, and what was found wasn't at all helpful. To this day, nothing has been able to get too close to the shipwreck to investigate and explore the phenomenon and very little is known about this mysterious ship. Many believe the lives lost in the wreck continue to haunt the ship and will keep anyone and everything out of it at all costs. And finally, in at number one, we have the unmapped ocean floor. This is truly one of the biggest mysteries, and humans' curiosity about the Earth's floor is centuries old. Much remains to be learned about the ocean, especially exploring the mystery of the deep sea. From mapping and describing the physical, biological, geological, chemical, and archaeological aspects of the ocean and understanding their dynamics. For centuries, scholars believed the deep sea to be a lifeless place until the late 19th century. We've discovered there is a diversity of life and creatures living down there. Many researchers and divers had tried to dive and take submarines down to explore more of this unknown place, but it's very hard due to the extremely cold temperatures, the darkness, and the literally bone-shattering pressure that's more than 1,000 times that at sea level. In 2019, a retired naval officer, Victor Vescovo, set a new record as one of the deepest dives to date, reaching almost 36,000 feet down in a submarine into the deepest place on Earth, the Marianas Trench. The ocean covers more than 70% of the planet's surface, driving well weather, regulating temperature, and ultimately supporting all life's organisms. Throughout history, the ocean has been a vital source of sustenance, transport, commerce, growth, and inspiration. But to this day, more than 80% of the ocean remains unmapped, unobserved, and unexplored, and it's still unknown how deep the ocean really is. Given the high degree of difficulty and cost in exploring our ocean using underwater vehicles, researchers have relied heavily on technologies such as sonar to generate maps of the seafloor, but currently less than 10% of the global ocean is mapped using modern sonar technology, and only about 35% of the United States have been mapped using modern methods. As we go deeper into the ocean floor, it's too deep for this modern technology because it's too remote and dark for this type of visual mapping. So if you go swimming in the ocean, it's very unknown of what is swimming and living below you. But scientists and researchers continue to develop technologies to unlock the many secrets of the ocean. The NOAA is working to increase our understanding of the ocean realm. In at number five, submarine disappearance. Back in 1968, submarines from four different countries just all of a sudden disappeared. The four submarines were the SS Scorpion from the US, the INS Derek from Israel, the Minor from France, and the K129 from the Soviet Union. There are 
many theories out there about what happened to these vessels from self firing torpedo accidents to government conspiracy theories. But nonetheless, all these submarines remain missing to this day with no explanation. And knowing how deep the potential remains could have sunk, it's unlikely we will ever know what happened to them. In our number four spot, mysterious creatures. Last year, a video circulated online. In it, we can see a giant blob like creature floating around near a deep drilling oil rig. This creature fascinated everyone as no one could tell what it was. It seemed to almost be glowing like it was lit from within. It was extremely large and managed to continuously change its shape. Some people figured it was an undiscovered creature and that it just decided to crawl up from the depths of the ocean while others took a bit of a stretch and they said it could have been some proof of some type of alien presence. Researchers soon found out that this was actually an insanely gigantic jellyfish. But many people were confused of why it came so close to the surface. It was possible that the drilling disturbed it from the deeper parts of the ocean. But nonetheless, it was the first time anyone had ever seen a jellyfish this size. And it's pretty creepy knowing that it's just been lurking down there and it's brave enough to come to the surface. At number three, Baltic Sea Anomaly. This was first discovered as recent as 2011 by a group of divers. They were pretty confused when they came across this 60 meter thick circular object that was in the sea at the depth of 90 meters. There's a 300 meter track that actually leads to this unidentified object. Both explorers and scientists are unable to figure out what it is or where it came from. Some speculate that this is a UFO ship that sunk in the water a long, long time ago. Then there's the theory that this was a German ballistic object that landed in the ocean during World War II. In at number two, Japanese mermaids. Now, I don't know about you guys, but personally, I believe in mermaids. They could be out there, we don't know. Wish I could be part of that world. But the mermaids I'm going to talk to you guys about were nothing like Ariel. Due to its geography, Japan has always had a close relationship with the waters that surrounded the islands. And centuries ago, the story of the human fish came to light. These stories of horror and fear were told by fishermen. The Japanese mermaids are described as grotesque beasts that look like a cross between a fish and a monkey rather than a fish and a beautiful woman. Some would even be said to possess horns and fangs. So basically, these mermaids would be able to shape shift so they could appear as beautiful women and lure fishermen into the water. Then they would turn themselves into giant jellyfish and kill the man and drag him to the depths of the sea. So it is a long shot, but I don't know, there's a lot of mysterious creatures in the ocean. And 95% of the ocean is still unexplored, so who knows what's happening down there. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. Which brings us to our number one spot, the scariest deep sea mystery, the unexplored sections of the sea itself. It's so scary to think that only about 5% of the world's seafloor has been explored. That leaves an insane 95% that's a mystery. The ocean covers more than 70% of the planet's surface. There's still so much to learn and explore. It's expected that there are millions of species that are still down there, aka mermaids, that are waiting to be discovered, and it's speculated that these creatures living in the deepest part of the sea will never be known. One of the scariest things in the world is the unknown. Coming in at number five, we have stranded ship. In Zakynthos, Greece, on the beautiful beaches lays a haunting sight of a stranded and rusting MV Panagiotis ship washed up on the shore in 1980 and continues to lay on the sand to this day. Many tourists come to view this phenomenon and due to the mysterious ship it's been nicknamed Shipwreck Beach. Little is known about the ship and is highly debated. One theory is that the ship was used for smuggling and abandoned when the crew were being pursued by the navy on their way to Piraeus from Albania. Another theory states that the ship was making its way from Turkey with the freight of contraband cigarettes headed for Italy. When encountering stormy weather, the ship went into a cove where the crew abandoned the ship in fear of getting caught. Soon after the ship was abandoned, rumours started swirling that the ship had many valuable items on it and authorities eventually convicted 29 people for looting cargo and valuable equipment from the wrecked ship. The location of the Panagiotis was prominently featured in the hit Korean drama Descendants of the Sun, leading to a surge of interest among Chinese and Korean tourists. This beach was briefly closed for tourists in 2018 due to the fear of landslides due to a large boulder falling onto the beach, but left the ship unharmed. The beach was later opened and that same year the beach was named as the world's best beach in a poll by over 1,000 travel journalists and professionals. The beach and surrounding areas are stunning, but the mysterious 
history of the ship lingers and gives creepy vibes when you're on vacation in such a beautiful place. Some tourists have stated while getting close to the ship they've heard noises coming from inside, and some locals believe that this ship is haunted by the past crew members. In at number 4 we have numerous lost cities. One of the most famous lost cities that have been located in the ocean is the lost city of Atlantis. The lost city used to actually consist of a few islands where the founders had created a utopian civilization and became a great naval power. Their home consisted of concentric islands separated by wide moats and linked by a canal. The island of gods contained gold, silver and other precious metal and had an abundance of rare and exotic wildlife. Many believe Atlantis and the story behind it was a fictional story that was created by an ancient Greek philosopher Plato, but others believe it was a real story and that the lost city is supposedly located in the Atlantic Ocean, while others say it's the Mediterranean or under Antarctica, and this is a popular debate. Besides the highly debated Atlantis, there are currently at least a dozen lost cities that rest at the bottom of the ocean near places like Greece, Japan and India. The sunken palace of Cleopatra is one of the most fabled underwater remnants of the ancient world. It had sunken more than 1400 years ago when an earthquake and tsunami hit Alexandria, Egypt. One of the most spectacular and intact lost cities is Shicheng, or otherwise known as the Lion City, which is located at the bottom of China's Quandeo Lake. Not from ancient times, but apparently it was purposefully flooded in 1959 to make room for a dam and an adjoining hydroelectric station. Another lost city comes from Dwarka, India, which is known as the Gateway to Heaven, which was an ancient city dating back as far back as 574 AD. The ancient Dwarka was sunken by the rising of the ocean levels and taken to the bottom of the sea at the Gulf of Cambay. Marine archaeological explorations have shed light on the structures and other artifacts these ancient people lived in. Many things have been seen and recovered like ancient structures, grids, pillars, stone anchors, pottery, stone sculptures, bronze, copper and so much more. In a number 3, a suspected UFO. In 2011 a group of Swedish divers discovered a mysterious object at the bottom of the Baltic Sea, which is a part of the Atlantic Ocean. The divers that were exploring the sea floor that came across the UFO shaped object had their equipment stop working as they approached the object. Professional diver Steven Hogenburn, who is part of the Ocean X team said that some of the team's cameras and satellite phones refused to work when directly above the object and would only work when they were at least 200 meters away from the so called UFO. The Swedish diving team noted there was a 985 foot flattened out runway leading up to the object, implying that it skidded along the path before stopping. Member Dennis Asberg said, I am 100% convinced and confident that we have found something that is very, very, very unique. Many of the divers were convinced that their finding was in fact a UFO, but some added theories that maybe the object could have been a meteorite or an asteroid, a volcano or a U-boat from the Cold War, but no one was really sure. The divers had returned to the site the next year to get a better look at the anomaly and had in fact found a second object near the first finding. They had taken a sonar image of the new finding due to mysterious electrical interference. It wasn't much of a clear image, and the group had only released the original finding image because the second finding was so blurry. With only a single blurry image and little information, many speculate that the object at the bottom of the Baltic Sea could in fact be a UFO, a portal into another world, or even an underwater Stonehenge. The theories received more attention when artist Hawk Vacht had created a 3D interpretation of the mysterious object, which looks eerily similar to a UFO or something not of this world. On December 10th, 2014, the website Earth We Are One actually published an article claiming a UFO shaped like a Millennium Falcon from Star Wars had been discovered at the bottom of the Baltic Sea and explained more about the dive and findings. We may never really know what this mysterious object truly is, and many believe it might be, but others believe it could be something else, but no one really knows. In at number 2 we have Giant Eyeball. In 2012 a giant eyeball was found by a beachcomber in Pompano Beach in Florida, and this discovery is baffling wildlife officials. The softball sized eyeball was reported to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and then sent to the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute in St. Petersburg to be put on ice, so further analysis could be done to try and figure out what sea creature this eyeball had come from. Marine biologists will use genetic testing to try and solve this mystery and try and find an answer. When the picture came out of this mysterious eyeball, the internet went crazy and the mystery eyeball soon went viral, and some have suggested that the eye came from a monster fish, a giant squid, or even a Whale. 
Many people are leaning towards the eyeball is from a giant squid, but the spokeswoman for the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, Carly Segelson, said they are leaning toward a different scenario. The primary suspect right now would be a large fish like a swordfish, a tuna or some sort of deep water fish species. Heather Bracken Grissom, an assistant professor in the marine science program at Florida International University in Miami, believed that this huge blue eyeball may have come from a deep sea squid or a large swordfish. The professor and her colleagues concluded that the eyeball's lens and pupil are similar in shape to that of a deep sea squid, and noted that a deep sea squid's eyeball can be as large as a soccer ball and can easily become dislodged. After the marine biologist test came back, they were still left with not many answers of what creature this eyeball came from, but it was determined to have bone fragments around it, debunking the theory of it being from a giant squid. Many different parts of different sea creatures have washed up or have been discovered by divers, but soon determined by marine biologists to be a specific sea creature or species, but this eyeball continues to be a mystery. This story just proves that we know very little about the ocean and who or what is swimming down there, especially in the deepest depths of the sea. And finally in at number 1 we have Icicle of Death or better known as the icy finger of death. It creeps through the ocean's depth like a frozen eel, an eerie phenomenon known as brine icicles. Brine icicles are most commonly called the icicles of death. It freezes everything it touches. Only discovered in the 1960s, these things grow towards the sea floor from the base of the Arctic and Antarctica sea ice. This phenomenon happens when extremely cold brine sink to the bottom of the water, reaching warmer seawater below. The water around it flash freezes, creating a descending tube of ice known as a brinicle. Sometimes an underwater icicle reaches the sea floor and when it does, a web of ice forms and spreads, entombing and freezing everything in its path, including any unlucky sea life such as a starfish and sea urchins. Andrew Thurber, professor at Oregon State University and avid diver, had actually seen a brinicle bloom firsthand and stated, they look like an upside down cacti that are blown from glass, like something from Dr. Zeus's imagination. They're incredibly delicate and can break with only the slightest touch. The formation of a brinicle was first filmed in 2011 by producer Catherine Jeffs and cameraman Hugh Miller and Doug Anderson for the BBC series Frozen Planet. They can even create brine pools, which are called the Black Pool of Death, and are toxic to marine animals due to their high salinity and anoxic properties, which can lead to toxic shock and possibly death. Based on what scientists have learned so far, they believe life on Earth may have originated from these tentacles and that they may even harbor conditions suitable for life to form on other planets and moons. Number 5. The Frilled Shark Chlamydoslacus ingenius and Chlamydoslacus africana, or better known as the Frilled Shark and the Frilled South African Shark, are the two extinct species of shark that swam our oceans. Thank gosh. Well, actually, still kinda do. Eh. The frilled shark is considered a living fossil. Not just its age and time spent surfing the coast, due to its primitive eel-like physical trait, the brown color, the jaws, 8 foot body, and the way its fins, spine and head move under the water are common in ancient serpents and water creatures. So this thing is like an eel serpent shark hybrid. Yeah. Little jarring. Commonly referred to simply as the frilled shark because of its six pairs of gill slits at its throat. It swims amongst the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, usually in deep, dark, murky waters of the outer continental shelf and upper continental slope. These deep dive sharks usually live and sleep near the ocean floor. Okay, that's that's a good sign, of course. They live on a diet of cephalopods, smaller sharks, and even swim to the surface at night to feed what's floating atop on the surface. When hunting, the frilled shark moves like an eel, bending and slithering to swallow prey with its long and flexible jaws, which are equipped with 300 rows of recurved needle-like teeth. So am I just gonna like snorkel into one of these things any day now? Well, good thing is they're really hard to find. Like, really hard. Usually caught by accident in commercial fishing nets, usually at depths anywhere between 50 and 1,000 meters. So unless you're free diving at night, you should be okay. Yeah, they like it deep and dark. I'd say these things are already scarier than the Meg. It's like a shark but an eel snake hybrid with a shark head and shark size teeth. That sounds a bit scarier. Well, I mean the Meg preferred warmer shallower water so maybe this one's a tie. I don't know who's snorkeling two miles deep but it's certainly not me, okay? In my opinion, I'd take a large great white over this dinosaur looking thing slithering after me any day. Number 4. The Fang Tooth Fish Ah yes, the Anoplogaster Cornuta or commonly known as the Fang Tooth. I wonder why. Though they spend most of their time in the deep, deep, common fang tooths are known to migrate towards the surface at night. Sorry, the fang tooths are known to migrate towards the surface at night. That is the scariest sentence I've ever said. Dude, these are way scarier than this giant ancient shark. 
Like all the scariest things come out at night. You notice that? And root canals, but they're usually done during the day. The word megalodon is Greek words meaning giant tooth. I'd take big teeth over this thing chasing me around any day. Thankfully though, this guy is only about a foot in length. Okay, that's not so bad. The fish has a mouth that are full of long snake teeth, perfect for hanging onto its prey as they shake. The lockable jaws ensure that although thrashing may occur, the fang tooth's teeth are locked clamps that effortlessly swim with dinner in its mouth, just getting dragged deeper and deeper down, wiggling and can't move, trying to run for their lives. Well, swim for their lives. And fish of any size. I'm sorry? Yep, any size. Common fang tooths have been recorded at depths of about 5,000 meters, so whatever lives down there, it's game on. Look at this thing. I was scared of sunfish and seaweed brushing up against my legs. This thing swimming by me? This thing? It looks like a night terror in itself, stalking their preferred prey of crustaceans and of course, other fishes the same size. Common fang tooths are more active than many other deep sea fish and seek out food for meal and sport rather than being purely ambush predators eating when they're hungry. That's terrifying. Packing up for the long winter, huh? Their huge mouth and very long teeth ensure that they are able to attack prey and actually hold on while they relocate them to a deeper, darker spot where they can kind of take their time on the meal. I've swam with sharks. In my opinion, this thing's way scarier. Like eating small critters running around the ocean floor, sure. But also imagine eating something the same size of itself with teeth, no problem. Slowly devouring it bite by bite. Yeah, that's way scarier, come on. Just reattaching itself every bite, taking you along for the free ride. Yeah, that's, that's, that's horrifying. And number three, the big fin squid. Of the genus Magnapinidae family, the big fin squid, or as I like to call it, this ocean alien with shoulders, belongs to a group of rarely seen cephalopods with a distinctive morphology, meaning they're really, really weird and rare. Magnapinai meaning big fin, of course. The first record of us catching and looking at this family comes from a specimen talismani caught off the Azores in 1907. This was our first look at this bizarre fish, but due to the damaged nature of the find, little information could be extracted and was classified just as a squid. The problem is when you pull these things out of its atmosphere, it just looks like a piece of wet crinoline dress all of a sudden. Don't get the whole terrifying effect, you know? In 1956, a similar squid was caught in the South Atlantic but during the 80s, two specimens were found in the Atlantic, then three more were found in the Pacific, and eventually the creatures found a place amongst the books as its own species, entering the family Magnapinidae. Squids, okay. So it's not actually a squid, but loosely related. Like a third cousin of maybe alien origin. This thing looks like it crashed here on an asteroid. I'm just gonna say it, doesn't it? Like there's only 12 of these, not many. The arms and tentacles are the same length. The appendages are also huge and held perpendicular to the body, creating the appearance of a illusion of arms and elbows, giving its trademark alien figure. Most remarkable is the length of the elastic tentacles, which has been estimated around 20 to 30 times its mass and length. Deep sea video evidence puts the total length of the largest specimens at 10 meters long. Yeah. That's two trucks. Close-ups of the body and head show us that the fins are extremely large, being proportionately nearly as big as those of a big fin squid. Hence, the comparison. While they do appear similar, no specimens or samples of the adults have been taken out of the water yet, leaving their exact identity, bodily functions, and internal organs a mystery. Awesome. Yes, more mysteries under the water. All right, I only had uh, really bad night terrors already. Let's just add this in there. Yeah, I'd take a shark swimming with a brain at me rather than this alien thing swimming up to me and just staring at me, trying to understand me for about an hour. Terrifying. Number two, the gulper eel. Uripharynx pelicanoides. The pelican eel, or what I just said, is basically a deep sea eel, like deep, deep sea. If you've seen the Ridley Scott's Alien film franchise or the Predator universe, you'll know that this thing looks exactly like that. Yeah, am I wrong? But instead of like eight feet tall, it's only three feet tall. Yeah, still terrifying. The pelican eel has been described by many synonyms, yet nobody has been able to demonstrate that more than one species of pelican eel exists. Ride in solo, huh? That's creepy. One of a kind kind of deal. It's also commonly known as the gulper eel or umbrella mouth gulper eel due to its terrifying size and function of its mouth. The mouth and jaws resemble a pelican's gulp, hence the name. The morphology of the pelican eel can be difficult to describe because they're so fragile and oddly shaped that they become damaged when they're pulled out of the deep sea's immense pressure. We can't just swim all the way down there and take pictures, you know? The pelican eel's most notable feature, its mouth, which is much, much larger than its body, like 
five times the size. The mouth is loosely hinged and can be opened wide enough to swallow a fish three times its size. This thing has like a lower mandible of a python, just like unhinging it before dinner. The lower jaw is hinged at the base of the head with no body mass behind it, making the head look abysmally huge. It's basically a swimming mouth with a spine, tail, and I think a brain? Yeah, we don't really know yet. With dot sized eyes, yeah. It usually is always moving too, rarely stationary. It hunts in some sort of folded state. The pelican eel's mouth has the capability to change to an inflated shape when hunting, giving the mouth its notably massive appearance. Dude, the mouth unfolds like the James Webb telescope. Like a hundred working parts. Technically, it's like a geometric shape unfolding as a mouth, followed by stretching, like a cootie catcher. Remember those? This thing eats like a cootie catcher. When the pelican eel is in pursuit of its prey, it slowly starts unfolding itself. Imagine this thing's trucking behind you, unhinging its jaw, slowly the closer it gets. The head and jaw structure unfold and spread horizontally, not vertically. Okay, that's scarier all of a sudden. The unspreading event, or as I like to call it, lunch, is followed by the inflation of the mouth from a stretchable skin of the head, which it feeds on prey. Then, water is expelled via the gills. Okay, so it's basically a large strainer, and after it eats, it blows itself out, releases all the water back into the water. Just wrings itself out. Come on, this thing is horrifying. Thank gosh, it only eats crustaceans and creepy little crawlies on the bottom seafloor. And number one, the phantom jellyfish. Stygio medusa gigantea. I love that word. Commonly known as the giant phantom jellyfish, is a part of the monotypic genus of deep sea jellyfish. Stygio medusa. With only around 110 sightings in 110 years, it's a jellyfish that is rarely seen. Well, I guess like once a year. I don't know, I'm not really good at math. Believed to be widespread throughout the world, it thrives in all oceans and seas, with the exception of the Arctic Ocean. Yeah, a little too cold for it. The Monterey Bay Aquarium remotely operated underwater vehicles have only sighted the beast 27 times in 27 years. Dude, what's with all the matching numbers? Is this a CIA run? A study conducted by the Journal of the Marine Biological Association of the UK revealed info regarding the species and had this to say. The Gigantia is thought to be one of the largest invertebrate predators on this planet. Planet. One more time, please. The largest predator. It is commonly found in the ocean's midnight zone, reaching depths of about 7,000 meters. Deepest human free dive is about 300 meters. Okay, okay. Yeah, we're good. Unless you have a wide lung span. The largest predators in the deep sea, the giant phantom jellyfish's typical prey consists of plankton and small fish. The S. gigantia tends to be dominant in locations with a low productivity system, meaning it deters other predators of fish, like it likes it quiet. A shy eater, I'd say. However, when this thing is hungry, it battles squids, eels, and even whales. Okay, never mind. Just when I thought this thing was really cute, it fights off whales for food. The first specimen weighing in at 100 pounds was collected in 1899, but it wasn't recognized as its own species until 1959. Imagine this thing chasing you and catching you, tangling you in like 100 feet of netting tentacles so it can just eat you slowly. Does this thing have a consciousness? Like, you can kind of tell if a shark is swimming near or close to you or what it's kind of feeling. This thing just slowly, softly swimming towards you before it ingests you, way scarier. Like, I'm convinced these landed here. The oceans are way scarier than things on land. We haven't even started to uncover the whole ecosystem yet. Number five on this list is a mistake. So I know that's kind of weird. How do you discover a mistake? Well, in a story from One Dumb Diver, and yeah, that is their actual handle, they do just that. They write, when I was 15, I took the family boat out and dove the reef myself to clear my head. That was mistake number one. I was down at a depth of about 90 feet when I was only rated for 60. While diving, I spotted a three and a half meter mako shark coming right at me. For those who are unaware, makos are basically the cheetahs of the ocean and they only have two speeds. Curious, which is harmless, and lunch. This guy was in lunch mode, so I hovered, as I'd been trained to do since there was no way for me to escape it. Nowadays, we dive with shark shields, which emit electronic pulses that freak the sharks out and keep them away, but back then, what we used was essentially a chainmail sleeve, the idea being that sharks hate the taste of metal, so if you give it your arm, it'll bite down, decide you're gross, and move along. So I wait, and it comes, and I make a perfect move to give it my arm. However, just before the crunch, it occurred to me, that I'd left my sleeve on my bed. I had my knife drawn, however now I had a series of problems. 
I had a huge open gashing wound on my arm from the bite in open water and trailed blood everywhere. Once the shock wore off, you realize that you're in salt water and salt water and open wounds, they don't feel too good. In a panic, I dropped my weight belt and shot up to the surface without any sort of waiting period. Because I hadn't been paying attention to the currents, I was approximately a quarter mile downstream of my boat, which means I had to swim up to it. So I end up racing back to shore with nothing more than a tourniquet to staunch the bleeding. Long story short, my series of unfortunate self-inflicted events earned me 172 stitches, boatloads of physical therapy because the shark had actually bitten down into my tricep and detached it, and easily identifiable scars on one of my arms for the rest of my life. So that story right there folks is why I personally don't think I'm ever going deep sea diving. I love sharks, they're super cool, I love to learn about sharks, but I am more than happy to keep them in a tank at the aquarium and learn about them in that way. Swimming with them or discovering one in front of you on the day that you also forgot your protective gear, not something that sounds like a great time. Number four on this list is a barracuda. El Herrera 9519 writes, one time when my parents visited Mexico, they went diving and my mom was slightly lower down than my dad looking at the ocean floor. My mom had on a gold necklace that was floating in the water around her. It was a sunny day and a fairly shallow dive, so it was sparkling. My mom looked below at all the critters when my dad grabbed her and started frantically shaking her arm to get her attention. She looked up and a barracuda was directly in front of her, staring intently at the shiny necklace. She slowly moved up her hand to cover the necklace and then slowly and calmly moved away from it and it took off without bothering them anymore but still pretty unsettling and taught my mom to be a little bit more aware of her surroundings when diving. So I looked it up and barracudas can grow to be 1.8 meters in length. Pair that with their extremely sharp teeth and the fact that shiny objects remind them of the little silver fish that they eat and you have yourself in a pretty bad situation. The woman in this story is honestly extremely lucky that this fish waited to decide if it was going to attack or not. Most times she wouldn't have had time to respond and it would have just gone to take a bite. Considering this necklace would have been around her neck, having a barracuda bite into it could have ended very badly. Number three on this list is a kelp forest. Duct Tape Jedi writes, After a day of boat diving in Monterey Bay on the California coast, we had a night dive planned. I was there with two friends celebrating my birthday and we were part of a larger group of divers. My friends were too tired for the night dive and I was too, but I got invited to buddy with another diver whose friends also decided to stay on the boat. So I was following my new buddy through the kelp when some of it caught on my tank. I tried to pull clear but managed to get tangled even more to the point where I was unable to move. I kept shining my light around looking for my buddy but he was nowhere to be seen. After what seemed like an hour but was possibly just a few minutes, I felt some of the kelp loosen up and then saw that my buddy was cutting it off with a knife. I was so exhausted after struggling that when we got to the surface, he had to tow me back to the boat. So discovering a full on kelp forest, I mean that would honestly be really cool I think. Obviously what happened to our diver would have been incredibly scary though. Having to wrestle for over an hour or however long he was there for with some kelp in the dark, probably thinking that you're going to drown, doesn't sound great. But if you did discover a kelp forest and that didn't happen, then I think it'd be pretty sweet. If you're going to go though, then make sure you carry your own knife because you wouldn't want to end up like our friend here. Number two on this list is a body. This story is from Texas Guy 911 and he says, I was diving in a local pond with a group of much more advanced cave divers than I was. I'm leading the dive as to get used to the pressures and responsibilities of heading the procession and they're mentoring me. The known horrible visibility makes it impossible to navigate by compass, so we follow a line put by other divers. These lines go from one sunken item to another. So I know I'm about to hit a small sunken boat, but I don't remember which one. There are a few similar in a row in the same state of decay. I'm the first in the group and I get to the boat and I see someone's black army boots sticking out from the inner quarters. It looks somewhat new, not like items you find on the bottom. It's hard to see due to so much muck in the water. So I touch the boot, thinking it's by itself, but it won't lift. Like it's attached to something heavy. I put my hand further in and feel the leg continuing out, pants, the calf, and now I see the second leg. 
I turn around and show a sign for the emergency ascend to the group behind me. Everyone has a sour face. Nobody wants to go to the surface, but it's a rule that if one says up, others in the group must abort, no questions. They wanted me to explain with signs why, but what's a diver's sign for a corpse? I feel like I rush toward the surface, even though I'm trying to stay calm and take time. So, we're on the lake's surface. I have this adrenaline rush, can't breathe enough. So I tell them there's a body down there. I see rolling eyes from everyone once they see I'm serious. I describe in detail what I saw and then we go down again. Once we locate it, we don't know if we should go forward or backward as there are several boats on the line and who knows in which boat the body is in and how far we drifted while taking it out on the surface. Well, we find all the boats before seeing the original one, of course. So, our customary leader goes into the boat's cabin and we wait. I'd say he was rather courageous at this point. Then he emerges from the cloud of muck and tells us all to surface. So, gluing information together from what we learned later on, it actually turns out the police or some other agency had body recovery training in the same lake the same day. When they went for lunch, they stuffed their fully dressed, anatomically correct rubber doll in one of the sunken boats for a few hours for safekeeping. So, that didn't turn out to be an actual body, but I still think this would have been super scary. To feel a leg and then another leg in the darkness of the water like that on one of your first dives, I mean, that would be a lot. Maybe I'm just weak because deep sea diving is just not for me, but honestly, that would have scarred me for potentially life, whether the body is real or not. Number one on this list is a survivor. Off the coast of Nigeria roughly eight years ago, a tugboat broke down and sank to the bottom of the ocean. Three whole days later, a diving crew went out to the wreckage to see what was down there and recover the dead bodies. It was thought that no one could have possibly survived the crash and that all 12 people on the boat were dead. That's why the crew was so shocked when they found someone had actually survived. Maybe this doesn't seem as scary as finding someone who had died, but we're lucky enough to have the actual clip of them recovering this person and just watch as the hand comes out. All right, you found one, yeah? Oh, he's alive, he's alive. The startled dive team discovered the tugboat's cook had survived for three days. So that one image of having a hand reach out of the dark and stormy nothing would have actually terrified me. Not to mention that man who survived down there. That would have been three days by himself surviving in this tiny air pocket, most likely believing that the world has left you for dead. This is definitely one of those scary discoveries that's for the better, because someone's life was saved, but as the Reddit user Edgar writes, I can't imagine how creepy and unexpected it would be to be on a mission to recover the dead and have a hand reach out to you like it did. Number five, giant isopods. No, this isn't a microscopic picture. This isn't a tick or a bug. This is a giant isopod. One of the scariest looking things picking around the ocean floor. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Imagining this thing wiggling around is enough to already be giving me the willies. Don't worry too much. You're not too likely to find one of these things crawling around your home as they usually live and feed about 1600 feet beneath the ocean depths. So you'll have to really go looking for one of these creepy little crawlies. We don't know a lot about isopods, actually. It's difficult to study them in their habitat unbothered deep in the ocean. And also, if I had to guess, I think realistically it's because no one wants to spend any more time looking at one of these little zerglings longer than they have to. Despite their outward appearance, isopods are actually pretty chill. That's the official scientific statement, judging a book by a cover and all that. They're scavengers more than they are predators, waiting at the bottom of the sea for debris to reach them, like discarded bits of meat from crabs or any number of fish which they'll snack on. So basically, they're the moochers of the ocean, waiting for somebody else to do all the work and they'll just uh, clean up the leftovers. It apparently isn't even that big a deal, though, because isopods have been observed to be able to go years and years without eating anything at all, with some reports going as far as five years without eating anything. I could not even imagine the hand Anger you would feel through that. Enjoying what we're putting out at Top 5 Scary? Of course you are, that's why you're here. Why not toss a cheeky little subscribe our way as a way of saying thanks? We'll trade you the best scary videos this side of the web in exchange. Number 4, Barrel Eye Fish. Has anyone ever accused you of being empty headed? I know that's something I've heard a lot in my time. I don't really know what that means. Unfortunately, my head, 
hollow as it might be, does not allow you to see inside because I am not a barrel eye fish. A being which is cursed to have a window for a forehead. The barrel eye fish may be one of the most confusing looking things under the sea. I, I mean, take a look at this thing. It kind of looks like it's not finished yet, you know? Like this fish was late for school and it forgot to put its face on. It's got its eyes inside its head and has a translucent head to accommodate that. You know, the rest of all life uh, thought, eyes on the outside, but the barrel eye just had to stand out and be different. Those two big green orbs are the fish's eyes, tinted with a sort of biological sunglasses kind of deal to help it zero in on light above it. The barrel eye uses its bizarre eyes to look upwards, tracking the shadows of its prey and then fixating on it. You wouldn't expect a creature that looks this weird to be an effective predator at all. Special organs on the fish's belly called souls deflect light from the creature's insides, illuminating the deep sea around it and also letting it camouflage. So this weirdo transparent head fish is also a mobile swimming light show. Just goes to show how absolutely amazing life down in the abyss is, where creatures will naturally adapt to their surroundings to evolve to have a flashlight built into them. Bless you, barrel eye fish. Bless you for being you. Number three, sarcastic fringe head. At first glance and description, the sarcastic fringe head doesn't sound particularly horrifying. It looks about as funky as most things you would see in an aquarium. And the name might make you wonder a little bit if it's got a reputation for being sassy, like maybe this is the fish that's always backhandedly complimenting you. Which would be terrifying in its own right, but not for the reasons we tend to highlight on this channel. No, the sarcastic name comes from the fish's kind of dour expression, and I definitely do see where that's coming from, because looking at photos of me, it looks like it's judging me just a little bit for my life's choices. Now when this fish opens its mouth, you'll understand why it earned a spot here. The sarcastic fringe head's mouth can open up wider than its body, creating this delicious delightful image you see here and you will probably be seeing for the rest of your days. Now if you're a little freaked out looking at this fish that looks like it crawled out of the upside down, that's understandable. But what if I told you that these fish have kiss fights? Sarcastic fringe heads fight for dominance with other fringe heads by expanding their very wide mouths and then pressing them together as a display to show who's got the biggest mouth. This is also how they attract mates, fighting off other fish and smacking their lips together to impress all the lady fringe heads, showing them just how wide their mouths go and man, it is taken so much restraint right now to be talking about this and trying to keep this at a PG rating. Number two, frilled shark. A frilled shark, all things considered, sounds pretty cute. Maybe you're picturing a shark with lovely frills hanging off of it like some other fish have, like a cool fringe denim jacket. Or maybe you're picturing a shark wearing something lacy and frilly. I'm not gonna judge, you do whatever you'd like. Unfortunately, neither of those fantasies are particularly accurate because like everything else on this list, the frilled shark is an abomination of the ocean. It's already unnerving enough to look at, serving massive alien vibe, the James Cameron kind, not the friendly little gray man kind. And then it opens its mouth and you understand where the name comes from as you're treated to a mouth of 300 thrilled razor sharp teeth like barbed wire. Just like the alien, they're able to open their jaws real wide to be able to snarf down prey considerably greater than their size. Although exactly how much larger is unknown. These little terrors hunt by swimming around with their maw open and using the darkness to try and lure smaller prey right into a trap before being engulfed by what looks like the world's sharpest car wash. I genuinely can't even look at this thing's mouth for too long without starting to feel a little bit queasy, imagining it biting into anything. The frilled shark is considered a living fossil, much like the coelacanth because in the 80 million years frilled sharks have been swimming across our planet, they haven't changed much. Like, at all. They more closely resemble prehistoric creatures than any of their contemporary shark counterparts. All that to say is, I guess, whatever nature was cooking with the frilled shark, clearly they got something right. They, they nailed it. If they, if they saw this thing for 80 million years and thought, absolutely no changes. This one's perfect. Number one, Colossal Squid. At our number one spot is a living legend, the Colossal Squid. Thought for many years to be an urban legend due to their elusive nature, for a long time not much was known about these cephalopods other than the fact that they are very, 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 very large. Reports of giant squids describe them as being anywhere up to a staggering 65 feet long, but collected squids range in at a much more humble 42 feet long. Oh. Okay, well that, that's, I was getting worked up over nothing. Humans and colossal squids don't particularly cross paths often, what with them living 3,000 feet under the sea. And that is definitely a good thing, because these squids are not something you would 
ever want to mess with. Its tentacles are lined with sharp hooks to sink into their prey and prevent them from getting away. Alongside the usual suckers that squid's tentacles have, hard toothy like rings that dig into prey and keep them wrangled. It's common to find whales covered in these scars or slashes and shreds from the hook of a giant squid. The thought of being grabbed by these tentacles is enough to stop me from ever ordering calamari again. What with being one of the bigger monsters swimming around down there, the colossal squid doesn't have much in the way of predators. I guess that's uh, kind of one of the benefits of being a 40 foot monstrosity. People stop messing with you, you know? People stop trying to pick on you. They start respecting you more and no one tries to eat you anymore once you're, you know, bigger than anything else down there. Starting off this countdown, we have the lamprey. The lamprey looks like something you would see in your nightmares. It looks like a mix between a snake, eel, and leech. They can be anywhere from 5 to 40 inches in length. And and they attack fish by sucking the life out of them. Lampreys have 11 or 12 rows of teeth that wrap around in their mouth like a ring. Once they latch onto their victims, they use their barbed tongue to pierce the fish and drain it of its blood. They also excrete a blood thinner to prevent blood clotting. What's scary is in the past they have been known to attack swimmers. But don't worry, their bites aren't deadly to humans. But still, I don't want one of those things latching onto me. No. Ooh, thank you. Now, these things are found in multiple environments. They live in salt water, fresh water, lakes or rivers, shallow or deep. They can survive in every environment. In fact, the Great Lakes are being invaded by them. In the early 20th century, they got to Lake Ontario and Lake Erie via shipping canals. And within a decade, they managed to infest all five Great Lakes. What's particularly scary is that one lamprey kills about 40 pounds of fish every year. Those things are bloodthirsty. Coming in at number four, we have tardigrades. When I first saw this thing, I was like, Psh, that's no way that's real. It looks like the caterpillar from Alice in Wonderland or something like that. So these creatures are often called water bears or moss piglets. And if you look at the photos of them, you'll see why. They got some plumpalicious bodies. So these creatures have eight legs and hands with four to eight claws on each. I mean, they kind of look cute in like a weird messed up way, but they're definitely not. There's something weird about them. They got this weird mouth with sharp teeth that extend outwards, allowing them to suck out nutrients from plants and microorganisms. And these things are almost indestructible. They can even survive in outer space. These things have been found from deep seas to even sand dunes. If an apocalypse happened, they would still be floating around in the ocean. Like, they can go up to 30 years without food or water and can survive in both absolute zero or above boiling temperatures. Now, these things are pretty small, which makes them less terrifying. They range from 0.05 millimeters to 1.2 millimeters in size. Now, although they look squishy, they are actually covered in a tough cuticle, which they shed in order to grow. So yes, it's small and chubby looking, but there's just something about it that makes it so unsettling. In our third spot, we have the viper fish. One of my biggest fears while swimming in the ocean is when my leg touches something that I can't see. Like, it's just immediate panic for me. I don't know what it is. It could be a garbage bag for all I know. But to me, it feels like a slimy tentacle that can grab me and pull me underwater. Now, I'm mentioning this because this creature's color is so dark that it makes it virtually invisible in the depths of the ocean. So, divers could be out exploring and not even know that this creature is lurking right next to them. So the viper fish can be anywhere from 30 to 60 centimeters in size, and it has a large mouth with needle-like teeth. They also have very creepy, beady little eyes. But what's interesting is that these fish actually can see in color. So that's just a little fun fact. Now, you don't want to get too close to these guys if you can help it, because they're considered one of the fiercest predators of the deep. And they have very big stomachs, so they can take down a lot more than they look like they are capable of. Moving on to number two, we have the sarcastic fringe head. Okay, so like, I'm picturing a fish with like bad bangs that goes like, oh wow, I'm so impressed, blub blub. That would be funny. But no, no, this thing is highly, 
highly aggressive. So this fish lives in the Pacific waters off the coast of North America. What they like to do is hide out in an area that covers them completely and then they just stay there and stalk their prey. When anything comes close to it, it launches out and attacks them. Now what makes them so terrifying are their demogorgon tight flaps around their face that open up to make them look intimidating. Either that or it kind of looks like the poison spitting dinosaur from Jurassic Park. Anyways, it uses this creepy mouth to attack its prey. Now these things are scared of nothing. They are known to attack creatures way bigger than them. In fact, there's one video of a fringe head swallowing a whole damn octopus. And what's worse is that they have been known to attack divers. If they can take down a massive octopus, just think about what they could do to us. In fact, divers have shared stories of their encounters with this fish and it ain't pretty. They will latch onto you and refuse to let go. And in our number one spot, we have the goblin shark. If you thought that last creature was bad, Wait till I tell you about this one. So the goblin shark is referred to as a living fossil. This is due to the fact that it was thought to have gone extinct millions of years ago. But in 1898, a goblin shark was spotted off the coast of Japan. Researchers realized that the shark was indeed still alive, and in fact, it barely changed over time. It looked like it just never evolved. So these creatures can grow 12 feet long and can weigh up to 460 pounds. It was thought that 13 feet was the biggest they could grow, but in 2000 they found a giant goblin shark that was 20 feet long. So now researchers say that they have no real idea about how big they can truly get. Now this thing has one of the creepiest looking faces. It's got a super long nose with weird Voldemort nostrils, pink flesh making it look like it was skinned alive, and of course it's got some weird sharp teeth. Oh. But it gets worse. These sharks don't hunt their prey down. Instead, they wait for their prey to come to them. They just chill in the water and when a fish gets close to them, they launch their jaws out and clamp down right on them. Yeah, their top and bottom teeth are attached to ligaments, so it can reach out and extend its mouth to grab its prey. And its mouth moves decently fast. It can launch out at about 10.1 feet per second. And its mouth opens super wide. It can open at a 111 degree angle. So its prey stand no chance. They think they're safe, then all of a sudden they are swallowed whole by this monster. Number five, Rose Veiled Fairy Wrasse. The C. finny fenma was spotted by John Randall in the early 1990s and was initially thought to be just an adult version of C. rubris quamus, a fish from the Maldives. However, just a couple months ago, a new strain of species was finally caught and analyzed. Though there have been hundreds of fish caught off the coast of the Maldives, this colorful, mesmerizing new addition is the first ever to be formally introduced and recognized as a brand new species. All right. Welcome to Earth, little buddy. I love this planet. Every day there's something new, eh? This thing is mesmerizing, right? Look at it, it's just so beautiful. Apparently it changes colors as it grows up too. Different year, different color. The rose-veiled fairy wrasses is one of the first species to have its name derived from the local Dhivehi language, with Finifenma meaning rose, a nod to both its beautiful pink hues and the island's national flower. Ah, we're starting this list off nice and easy. Imagine swimming with these. This is beautiful. Nice little rainbow around you. Of course, us being us. This species being so new and abundant has started making it, of course, at high risk of over-exploitation. Yeah, don't forget what we do to fish. Yeah, humans can be the worst for this planet also. Already talks of commercialization, tasty new dishes, and exotic deep sea tanks before it's even got a scientific name. That should be a metaphor about how we are. You know, something so new and precious and we're already craving over it. The beauty of nature, I guess. The discovery is part of the California Academies of Science Hope for Reefs initiative started in 2016 by a team of marine biologists and deep sea divers. It was created to explore, explain, and sustain the world's coral reefs by making fundamental breakthroughs in coral reef biology. That's awesome, dude. Okay, so there's like some pure people still out there trying to help. That's beautiful, all right. One for humanity. Okay, we're trying here. Number four, the blanket octopus. The blanket octopus gets its name from its female counterpart, the very rarely seen and supersized female blanket octopus. She has a long fleshy cape that wraps around her tentacles. This cape makes the octopus appear larger and more intimidating to predators. Though the female blanket octopus is already large growing to around two and a half meters in length, the males only grow up to about 
one inch weighing in at a monstrous one pound. All right. The caped female growing upwards of 40% bigger in mass and size. 40% his size. Okay, this species is much more interesting now. 40 times bigger than its counterpart? Just a little guy, you know? You got this, little man. That's like us dating a sperm whale. How does he not get lost in that big cape? Hey, soulmates are soulmates, right? In fact, the blanket octopus exhibit one of the most extreme sexual size dimorphisms known in any of the animal kingdoms. That's a really cool fact. Unique love, you know? That's like donkey and dragon from Shrek. But on a bleaker note, unfortunately scientists don't think that they live very long. Sad, I know. Like many other octopuses, they are short lived at approximately one to two years for females and three to four years as males. The tiny male drifts through the ocean seeking a mate while protecting their precious reproductive arm tucked away in a sack between their mouth and eye. Males die soon after they mate while females will continue to live and grow for many months and years longer than the males, spawning around 100,000 eggs which are carried by her under her arms. Blanket octopuses can be found in both tropical and subtropical waters. They apparently are reported to feed on seafloor mollusks and small fishes. It's not fish, eh? Yeah, it's fishes. Yeah, I, didn't, I never knew that. It's fishes. I like that. Blanket octopuses are also immune to venom, like from the Portuguese man of war, the huge jellyfish. Female blankets actually rip their limbs off and use them as weapons. They use the tentacles of jellyfish to sting other predators for both offense and defense. This is like my new favorite animal. These should be called Joan of Arcs, because that's like the energy I'm getting here. When threatened, the female unfurls her large net-like membranes that spread out like Batman's cape, making her instantly three times the size of an already 12 foot body. Hmm. Gentle giant or limb ripper offer? You tell me. Number three, the glass octopus. A rare encounter with a glass octopus has just happened, which is one of the strangest and coolest species that swim these oceans. These science fiction looking dudes have transparent gelatinous bodies and scientists believe that they have evolved into their elongated shape in order to make itself next to invisible, even when right beside it. That's pretty cool. The only colorful parts on them are their optic nerves, eyeballs, and digestive tract. Yeah, basically like a see-through Game Boy. Remember those? About like three times the size of a Game Boy 2 at about 20 inches long. It's likely that these octopuses eat whatever is down there at the depths of the twilight zone and midnight zone. Yeah, like deep, deep and cold. Footage of the glass octopus is super new and before this expedition, scientists had almost no documentation of the animal in the wild. That means they've mostly had to learn about it just by studying remains found in the guts of other predators. But now, thanks to the Schmidt Ocean Institute armed with close range high def videos and pictures, scientists and biologists are now able to learn a little bit more about this mysterious ghostly creature. Quote, the ocean holds wonders and promises we haven't even imagined, much less discovered. Wendy Schmidt, co-founder of Schmidt Ocean Institute. Thanks to a recent expedition in the US Pacific remote islands, the Schmidts led a 34 day trip that brought scientists together from all around the world to document deep sea creatures on deep sea mounts. See, this is what I'm talking about. All the while using a remote controlled vehicle named Sebastian. I love it. I get it, Little Mermaid, I got you. Scientists observed not one, but two octopuses, adding further to more knowledge and behavior of this elusive species. The glass octopus is considered one of the least studied cephalopods in our ocean. I'm excited. Let's go 2022. So far, so good. Great year for fishes. Number two, the colossal squid. Sometimes called the Antarctic squid or giant cranch squid, or famously known as <gasps> The Kraken. It's believed to be the largest squid species ever. It's the only member of the Mesonicothelius genus and is only known from a handful of sightings throughout history. Ah yes, the old sea captain's log, huh? The species is confirmed to reach a mass of at least 1,500 pounds, making it the largest known invertebrate on the planet. Biggest one so far is 20 meters. That's like the pitcher's mound to home plate. Yeah. This thing is massive. Though the species has similar anatomy to other squids, it's the only member to display hooks on its arms and tentacles. Okay, that's a little scary. It lives in the Antarctic and is found at depths of the twilight zone, like 2,000 meters down. Little is actually known about the creature, what it eats and what it does all the way down there. Scientists say it's bioluminescence as well, which attracts prey. Look, if this thing was flying instead of swimming, just one atmosphere difference, I'm just gonna say it, this thing would be an alien. You know what I mean? I'm, I said it. 
I mean, no wonder it's got a reputation for swallowing up ships by pirates. The first specimens were spotted in 1925, but in the early 2000s, fishermen got lucky and they pulled up the largest colossal squid ever found. It's now on display at the Museum of New Zealand. Kind of sad that when we see these beautiful things, the first thing we think is to yank them out of the water. I like the underwater cameras and free divers Blue Planet style, just swimming down there with krakens. Okay, maybe not. Yank it up, boys. Get it up, that thing's horrifying. And the number one spot, the blood belly comb jelly. Sounds like a magical elixir. From the family Lampictenidae, this specimen was first caught and studied by George Matsumoto, the marine biologist at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, who discovered the blood belly jelly in 2003. Now we're sure these things weren't discovered on like one of Jupiter's moons or something already in the 30s. We're sure of that. Cause that thing's blinking like a you know what. Not many of these things have actually been caught though. I've never seen anything like this before. Brilliant and then seemingly electric. The bloody belly comb jelly comes in different shades of red as well. The sparkling display on the outside comes from light reflecting and refracting off tiny transparent hair like cilia. Basically this thing is like a swimming light bright. Remember those light brights from the 90s? This thing is like the alive version of that. Of course, alongside its mystic nature, it also poops sparkles. Seriously, like a little alien unicorn. That's neat, right? Its name comes from its ruby red color. While it's pretty much invisible from underneath its belly, from above and in front, it lights up like the 4th of July, luring predators in with its mesmerizing patterns. Red is nearly invisible in the deep sea, so the vibrant crimson that gives the comb jelly its name is actually helping it hide. Blood bellies are technically xenophores, not true jellyfish. Many comb jellies have calloblasts lining their tentacles, which work like glue instead of venom. Upon touch, a spiral filament automatically bursts out and releases this sticky glue stuff. Once a fish is unable to swim away, the comb jelly reels in its tentacles and brings the food to its mouth. Um, okay, so this thing just became absolutely terrifying again. The deep dark sea, we gotta respect it. How insects and how jellyfish eat scares the out of me. I just I can't explain it. Watch it for yourself. Kicking off today's list, we have the sunken city of Dwarka. Until roughly 50 years ago, it was simply a legend, a story passed throughout the ages. The most famous legend about the lost city of Dwarka can be found in the ancient epic of Mahabharata. Dwarka, similar to Atlantis, is said to have sunk beneath the sea at some point in the distant past. According to the sacred scripture of Srimad Bhagavatam, the city of Dwarka was built in response to Jarasandha, the ruler of Magadha, who was constantly attacking Mathura. To prevent further attacks on his clan, Lord Krishna decided to establish a separate city on India's western coast. The city quickly rose to prominence and began the unstoppable pivot of Lord Krishna's mission, housing thousands of people in approximately 900 palaces that were crafted out of silver, gold, and precious stones, along with being heavily fortified and could only be reached by ship. At the time, the city of Dwarka quickly became a talking point around the world, inspiring awe and wonder. According to the Mahabharata's 23rd and 34th stanzas, the city was inundated and submerged by the Arabian Sea on the day that Krishna departed the earth to join the spiritual world after 125 years, and this is when the Kali Age began. The ocean's deity reclaimed the land, sinking the lost city of Dwarka, but sparing Lord Krishna's palace. It is also said that the lost city of Dwarka was attacked by Vimana, a flying machine. The description of the fight encourages ancient alien theories, as it appears that it was fought with sophisticated technology and powerful weapons from orbit. The spacecraft launched an attack on the city using energy weaponry, which resembled a lightning strike to onlookers, and it was so devastating that much of the city lay in ruins following the attack. A marine scientist discovered remnants of an underwater civilization near the coast of Dwarka, the city that's still on land that is, in the 1970s. And in 2002, scientists discovered an extremely advanced civilization from the past lying untouched beneath the ocean surface. With the help of sound matrix and image technology, along with sub-bottom profiling, marine scientists were able to find the exact location of the city, including some stone structures. The lost city of Dwarka was officially found 120 feet underwater in the Gulf of Cambay, Kambat off the western coast of India. Thanks to carbon testing, it was established that the city is anywhere between 7,000 to 9,500 years old and stretches out 7 to 8 kilometers long and 3 to 4 kilometers in width. The most fascinating or creepy thing about this underwater city, depending on your point of view, is that all human remains are still intact. Ergo, the main reason it made its way to today's list. Look, I'm not a scuba diver, but I can't think I'd be too fond of swimming around casually, admiring, you know, architecture, and bam! 
perfectly preserved dead bodies. During the 2002 excavation of Dwarka, many mud vessels, temple bells, ancient ritualistic vessels, and you know, other artifacts were found, with the carbon dating indicating that they date back to roughly 7200 BC, otherwise known as the prehistoric period. At the time of this research, scientists also found that a massive man-made wall that's almost 2,000 feet tall that has since been unearthed during periods of low tide and can't be easily seen. Granted, they're still waiting on absolute results from some strange structures made of iron they weren't able to identify. Maybe they're from the aliens? In fourth place, we have the Antarctica sea spiders. Okay, I'll admit it now, this one might be on the list purely because of how much it made me jump while researching. Seriously, look at the photos of these things. Mm. Yeah, this reaction is genuine. If I get nightmares tonight, I'm blaming y'all, okay? Before I start talking specifically about the big guys, time to dive into exactly what sea spiders are. Sea spiders are marine arthropods of the Pantopoda order and belong to the Pycnogonida class. They're cosmopolitan, and well, to some of us that sounds like a fancy drink. It just means they're found in oceans around the world. Lucky for me. There's over 1,300 known species, and they have legs ranging from one millimeter to over 70 centimeters in length. And that's over two feet in length. Well, most of them are towards a smaller end of this range, that one qualify as terrifying now. Would it? Although sea spiders are not true spiders, or even arachnids, their traditional classification as chelicerites would place them closer to true spiders than to other well-known arthropod groups, such as insects or crustaceans if correct. Sea spiders tend to either walk along the bottom of the ocean with their stilt-like legs, or just swim above it using an umbrella pulsing motion. They're mostly carnivorous predators, or scavengers, that feed on sponges, polychytes, and bryozoans. Alright, time to talk specifically about the big guys. Those really long legs I mentioned a moment ago are everything to the Antarctic sea spider, since they're where its vital organs are kept, because it doesn't have much of a body. Its proboscis is also important, because that's what it uses to suck the insides out of worms, jellyfish, sponges, and other soft body prey. Sounds delicious, I guess? Right now, all I can picture is like that one scene from The Lion King where Timon and Pumbaa are sucking the insides out of squishy bugs, and I'm pretty sure Simba and I are having the exact same facial reaction. For my brain's sake, it's highly unlikely for most of us to ever come across one of the giant spiders, since they only live in the oceans around the polar regions. Gigantism has been observed in a number of other Arctic and Antarctic species, leading to biologists to consult a couple of theories that certain elements elements of the polar environment must be conducive to humongous body size. Over several hypotheses have been put forward, with some scientists claiming that large body size may have developed as an evolutionary trait to enable animals to withstand long periods of starvation during the winter, when resources tend to become, you know, scarce in the polar regions. While others have suggested that some of these species may be somehow descended from creatures that invaded the Arctic and Antarctic from the deep sea, where high rates of gigantism have also been recorded. However, a recent study lends support to an entirely different theory, which resolves around the availability of oxygen in the polar oceans, since oxygen is more soluble in cold water than warm water. It has been suggested that this high availability of oxygen, coupled with the fact that low temperatures slow animals' metabolism down and reduce their need for oxygen, could facilitate their gigantism. And hey, they're not venomous, so overall, they're not as dangerous. Uh, but that's not going to stop my fears. In third place, we have the Mariana Trench. I'm just going to apply apologize in advance, because I know I'll slip up at some point, if not every time, and say Mariana's Trench out of habit. I can't help it. They're my favorite band. Even writing up my points today, I kept adding in the extra S. Feel free to let me know in the comments if you're also a fan. The Mariana Trench is an oceanic trench located in the Western Pacific Ocean, about 200 kilometers east of the Mariana Islands, and it is the deepest oceanic trench on Earth. It's crescent-shaped and measures about 2,550 kilometers in length and 69 kilometers in width. The maximum known depth is roughly over 36,000 feet, plus or minus another 80 feet, which is way too much math for my brain. At the southern end of a small slot-shaped valley and its floor known as the Challenger Deep. For reference, if Mount Everest was located at this point in the trench, its peak would still be underwater by more than two kilometers. And just remember, that's the world's tallest mountain we're talking about here, not some cute little hike. The Mariana Trench has been a major area of intrigue throughout history, with the trench first being explored during the Challenger Expedition in 1875, 
using a weighted rope, which recorded a depth of 26,850 feet. In 1877, a map was published titled the Tiefenkarte des Grosses Oceans, or Depth Map of the Great Ocean, for those of us who don't feel like butchering a pronunciation today. Most recently, in 2011, it was announced at the American Geophysical Union Fall Meeting that a U.S. Navy hydrographic ship equipped with a multi-beam echo sounder had conducted a survey which mapped the entire trench to 330 feet resolution. As of 2022, 22 crewed descents and 7 uncrewed descents have been achieved. Some notable discoveries over the years include the 1960 expedition, which claimed to have observed large creatures living at the bottom, such as flatfish that were about 30 centimeters long, and shrimp. In July of 2011, a research expedition deployed untethered landers, or drop cams for those of us that prefer simple English, equipped with digital video cameras and lights to explore this deep sea region. Gigantic single-celled organisms with a size of more than 10 centimeters in diameter, belonging to the class of Monothelamia, were observed. Monothelamia are noteworthy for their size, their extreme abundance on the seafloor, and their role as hosts for a variety of organisms. In December of 2014, a new species of snailfish was discovered at a depth of approximately 26,722 feet, breaking the previous record for the deepest living fish seen on video. During that 2014 expedition, several new species were filmed, including amphipods known as supergiants, bringing us back to that deep water gigantism I talked about earlier. Now, before any of y'all go, but Alexa, why is this scary? Well, it's because it's a constant unknown. Being so large and so deep, something new and creepy is discovered every time people explore its depths. Who knows what's still hiding down there? In second place, we have the blue-ringed octopus. Now, just a little background, an octopus is a soft-bodied, eight-limbed mollusk of the octopoda order that consists of around 300 different species. Like other cephalopods, an octopus is bilaterally symmetric with two eyes and a beaked mouth at the center point of the eight limbs. The soft body can radically alter its shape, enabling octopuses to squeeze through small gaps. The siphon is used both for respiration and for locomotion by expelling a jet of water. Octopuses have a complex nervous system and excellent sight, and are among the most intelligent and behaviorally diverse of all invertebrates. Octopuses inhabit various regions of the ocean, including coral reefs, pelagic waters, and the seabed. Some live in the intertidal zone and others at abyssal depths. All octopuses are venomous, but only the blue-ringed octopuses are known to be deadly to humans. Ergo, why they're my focus today. This specific species can be found in tide pools and coral reefs in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, from Japan to Australia, and can be identified by their yellowish skin and characteristic blue and black rings that change color dramatically when threatened. They eat small crustaceans, including crabs, hermit crabs, shrimp, and other small sea animals. Despite their small size, that ranges from 5 to 8 inches in circumference, they are very dangerous to humans if provoked when handled because their venom contains a powerful neurotoxin tetrodotoxin, which can cause loss of all sensations and paralysis of voluntary muscles, including the diaphragm and intercostal muscles, ergo stopping breathing. The full list of possible side effects from the venom include nausea, heart failure, severe and total paralysis, blindness, and can lead to death within minutes. The blue-ringed octopus carries enough venom to kill 26 adult humans within minutes. I'm just going to repeat that to be clear, 26 adult humans within minutes. Their bites are tiny and often painless, with many victims not realizing they have been envenomated until respiratory depression and paralysis begins. Oh, and by the way, there is no such thing as blue-ringed octopus antivenom available. And finally, in first place, we have the stonefish. Now, you might be asking, after the deadly octopus and a literal pit in the ocean, how can we get scarier? Welcome to where I almost jumped out of my chair and onto the floor. Stonefish are a family of fish called Cynocidae. They are famous for being the most venomous fish in the world, with a sting that causes excruciating pain in, you guessed it, humans. Their venom is lethal to other marine animals and humans, causing intense pain, breathing problems, damage to the heart, fits, and paralysis. Now, thankfully, unlike the blue-ringed octopus, there is an anti-venom, but if it's not delivered quickly, the effects can be... Fatal. We know of five different species that exist. The midget stonefish, or the Orsinacea alula, Estuarine stonefish, or Orsinacea orida, the Red Sea stonefish, or Orsinacea nana, the Orsinacea platyrincha, and simply the stonefish, or Orsinacea verrucos. Look, I tried my best. They hail from the coastal regions of the Indo-Pacific Ocean, so northern Australia, India, the Philippines, and others. Their name comes from their ability to blend in with rocky seafloors and amongst coral, which is what makes them easily stepped on by people and is a good chunk of the danger. They have 13 spines along their backs, which is what delivers the toxin, and at the base of each spine is a venom sac, which is activated under pressure. So, you know, when somebody 
accidentally steps on them. Now, if that's not terrifying enough for you, because we do have a reputation to uphold here, scientists at the University of Kansas have discovered that stonefish also have a hidden switchblade in their face that they can flick out whenever they feel like they're in danger. They call this bony, blade-like protrusion a lacrimal saber, and it's located on a bone under the fish's eyes. The saber is housed inside the fish's head, and they use their cheek muscles to deploy it. One good thing, at least, is that it's not venomous like their spines. Number five on this list is a giant eel. This is a true story that comes in from a Reddit user, RCMW, W181. They write, an old World War II ammunition ship off the south coast of England was full of brass topped shells. Most had been taken by divers over the years and it was now very rare to see them apart from a pile in one corner of the ship. The pile of shiny brass metals was miraculously untouched and remarkably clean after spending years underwater and you only found out why if you swam near them. Out of the murky darkness, the largest eel I have ever seen snakes forward. Without exaggeration, this thing had a head the same size as a horse's head full of jagged teeth. I could not see the body as it looped into the dark and deeper into the ship. No one got near those shells. Turns out for years this thing had been guarding the shiny brass shells, slithering over them, making them shine. We found out at a bar later that he was famous in the area and many people went to the wreck just to see him. No idea why this giant creature was guarding them like a dragon and its horde, but some said eels are like magpies and like shiny things. There are multiple scary discoveries in this story in my opinion. First off, our Reddit user just glosses over the fact that they're in a sunken World War II munitions ship. They don't say so, but I would have imagined that people would have died on that ship when it sunk, and there may have even been some remains of the dead still down there. Then, to come face to face with a giant eel that is extremely protective over these brass shells would be terrifying. If that was a giant moray eel, then those creatures can grow up to two and a half meters in length and can be very deadly in the water. Had that creature interpreted what our diver was doing as threatening, then they may not have made it to shore later that day to be able to share the story. Number four on this list is a freezer. This story from a Reddit user is just all kinds of creepy. Count underscore Dynamo writes, I've done a number of dives, and the strangest thing I ever saw was a large deep freezer with a heavy industrial chain wrapped around multiple times with about five cinder blocks attached. It was very rusted, and the deep freezer itself had to have been 30 years old, probably more. This was about 90 feet just off of Vancouver Island, Canada. The situation gave myself and the other divers the heebie-jeebies. Logged the GPS and depth coordinates and notified the police. We were able to find out what was inside since one of the divers had friends with the local police. 10 porcelain dolls. Now for starters, I'm actually kind of happy that they found porcelain dolls inside that freezer because when I was initially reading that story and heard about a freezer that was locked up and weighed down, I initially thought of a dead body, but having 10 porcelain dolls raises a lot of questions. Were these dolls potentially cursed and that was the only way to get rid of them? If you've ever come in contact with a cursed doll, then locking it up is the first thing to do. Ed and Lorraine prove it with their handling of the Annabelle doll. If these dolls are cursed though, then this discovery gets even more scary. Clearly, whoever locked them in that freezer threw them to the bottom of the ocean and didn't want them to be found. Bringing them back up to the surface probably wasn't the best idea. Number three on this list is a color change. Now, a color change doesn't really sound that scary at all, but in this particular case, it's definitely pretty creepy. A diver writes, I was diving off the coast of Fiji and we went through a natural tunnel, like a 10 meter cave slash passage through a rock formation. So we start swimming through the cave and suddenly the light was weird, like the blue tint from the water has been replaced by a red one. Now all divers will know that this isn't only weird because the color changed, but also because red is the first color to disappear after a certain depth, usually between 30 to 40 feet, and we were well over 70 feet. Also bear in mind this was late morning on a sunny day. So imagine this scene. Me and my dive buddy are going through an underwater cave and suddenly everything, for no apparent reason, is tinted red, a color that you were literally supposed to be unable to see while diving at that depth during the day. Upon exiting the cave, everything was back to blue. I thought it was just me, so I didn't signal to go back up. After the dive, my buddy asked me if I'd seen the water tint red as well. We can't explain it, and the folks from the local dive shop had no idea what we were talking about. Now that story is super weird. We've got to keep in mind that these guys were 70 feet below the surface at that point. If I was 70 feet below the surface and everything changed colors to a deep red, I would be very scared for my life. 
Obviously, we don't know for sure, but it sounds like that cave that they stumbled upon is haunted by something. It's either haunted by something, or that particular cave can produce some strange light phenomenon. Either way, it would have been very frightening, and I'm glad that the two divers in this story made it out okay. Number two on this list is a school of sharks. The next discovery comes in from a professional diver in the Bahamas who was diving down to recover a dead body. What's crazy about this story is that the dead body isn't the scary part. His online name is Keith Ba, and he writes, after an hour or two of searching, I went back into the blue hole to see if there were any signs of him. Saw the glint of his watch and his arms sticking out near the bottom. Started descending down to the bottom to recover the body. On the way down, realized that the bottom was a school of sharks that must have been there for breeding. So many sharks that they blocked the view of the actual bottom. Descended into darkness, grabbed his arm, couldn't stand to look at the body, and started ascending. The sharks followed, and were circling around the both of us. Had to take a break at halfway at around 60 feet as to not get the bends. Extremely scared. The entire time waiting to normalize, being super scared. Victim was struck by a passing boat. So not only is finding a dead body underwater super scary in my opinion, but to stumble upon so many sharks that you can't even see the bottom of the ocean. That's beyond terrifying. Then to have said sharks follow you up to the surface, deciding whether or not they're going to eat you, would have been absolutely brutal. He didn't specify what type of sharks they were, but after doing some research, sharks tend to get far more aggressive during mating, and therefore the risk of our divers getting attacked is significantly increased. Also, the number of sharks that can gather during mating season can rise into the hundreds. One shark is scary enough and will likely win in a fight, but tens to even hundreds of them would have easily had their way with this diver. Not sure about you guys, but if that was me, I would be exclusively a land dweller from then on out. Number one on this list is a person. People aren't typically scary discoveries, but in this case by some deep sea divers, it definitely was. One diver writes, me and two buddies were on a night dive in the Puget Sound hunting prawns. It was about 1am and we're a good 100 feet deep, the darkest black you could imagine. We used to do this thing on night dives where we'd get in a circle, turn off our lights, then stir up the water and watch the bioluminescence float around us like floating stars in a black watery space. Only this time, we turn off our lights, stir up the water, and the water glows just enough to reveal a fourth person sitting in our circle. We were at a dive resort, so it wasn't so odd to see another diver, only it was 1am and we'd see nobody else prepping a dive at the dock. He was also alone, which was odd considering the dangerous conditions of a night dive in those waters, and he had no fins or gloves. I don't know how he swam so well without fins or didn't get hypothermia without boots or gloves. We wore dry suits because it was so cold, but this dude was in a wetsuit with exposed skin. We thought we saw a giant gash on one of his legs. So the three of us all notice him and we're too scared to move. I can hear my buddies panting in their regs and the guy just smiles, waves, and then swims away. Whenever you think you're alone and someone just shows up like in an alley at night, it's weird. A hundred feet underwater at night is terrifying. After reading this story, I got some serious ghost vibes. Now obviously I can't know for sure and those divers didn't either, but this man just appeared out of nowhere and had a giant gash on his leg. He also wasn't wearing the proper gear and they didn't see him enter the water when they were getting ready to go. Potentially, rather than just be another diver out and about, this is the ghost of someone who went diving and died. Now their spirit just swims through the ocean for eternity. I've read a lot of ghost stories and reports of sightings before, and that has all the telltale signs of one. <laughs>